So having considered Newton's case, we see that his argument is a fairly strong argument. He walks through a number of possible criteria for personhood, and he summarily rejects each one of those. But even though Noonan makes a strong argument, we want to ask, are there any potential problems with it? And there are a number of questions or concerns we could raise for his argument. And one thing we might want to press Noonan on a little bit is whether or not conception provides a clear cutoff, or at least as clear a cutoff as he suggests. Remember, Noonan said personhood can't occur along a continuum where you have a vague case, a case being one where it's not clear if it falls into category X or category Y. And he claims that conception is a clear cutoff. Well, as it turns out, that's not entirely true. Uh, conception is not an instantaneous process. In fact, when the sperm enters the egg, it takes anywhere from 24 to 48 hours for conception to occur. As a result of this process, you are going to be stuck with the fact that there's going to be an unclear boundary line between when conception has occurred and when it hasn't. There's going to be vagueness involved. Now, you may not know about it, uh, or you, this may never occur because you only find out about conception once it's taken place, but that doesn't change the fact that conception itself doesn't provide a clear cutoff. Uh, it just, as a matter of fact, doesn't. So, Noonan is technically incorrect about conception providing a clear cutoff. Um, I, I don't know how serious a problem this is. I, I'm, I'm curious what Noonan's response would actually be. Uh, but this is something we could press him on. I think a more important problem that Noonan, uh, his argument doesn't address fully, is what we would say about uh, non-human uh, non-human entities that seem to be uh, persons by our definition of person. Uh, in fact, the, the reality is, is that uh, there could very well be other kinds of organisms that have a right to life but aren't biologically human. And, you know, I've mentioned alien visitors before or maybe members of other species such as Neanderthals. Uh, it's at least conceivable that there could be other types of biological organisms that do in fact have a right to life despite being uh, non-human. And this raises just a question is, at the end of the day, has Noonan done an adequate job of demonstrating that human biology is morally relevant? Uh, what he says is that at conception, a brand new genetic code emerges. Okay, now, why is that exactly morally significant? What's morally significant about that? I mean, at con conception of giraffes, a brand new uh, giraffe DNA emerges. So why doesn't it make it uh, up into a person? At conception of a rat, a brand new uh, DNA emerges, a brand new genetic code emerges. So why doesn't it make that uh, into a person? What is so special about a human genetic code? Noonan doesn't say. He just asserts this. And all of the arguments he makes to show that the emergence of a human genetic code is morally significant could be made for any other organism. At uh, the birth, uh, I'm sorry, at the conception of, like I said, a rat or a panda or a snake or whatever you want, uh, a brand new genetic code emerges. You still have a, a similar shift in probabilities uh, like you had for uh, humans. So why is a human uh, genetic code so special? Why is it that humans uh, are, in fact, persons at that stage? Why aren't rats persons uh, or cats persons or dogs persons as soon as conception takes place? What's so special about the human genetic code? He doesn't really answer this. He just asserts that it's special. And finally, and I think this is also a very serious problem for Noonan's uh, argument in general, is that he considers four possible criteria for personhood, and he rejects each one of those. But here's a, a very important thing to keep in mind. Whenever somebody offers you a set of alternatives and says, hey, these three or these four alternatives don't work, so we only have this final one left, a good question you always need to be asking is, are there more options available? Are there other options that haven't been considered? 
And this is, I think, something important we need to ask Noonan. Uh, you know, the things he mentioned, viability, social visibility, uh, sentiment of the parents. All right, some of these seem uh, like they might be reasonable criteria for persons, but some of them don't seem. I mean, I don't know why anybody would actually think social visibility is necessarily a, a good criteria for personhood. I wouldn't have thought that. Or, or even sentiment of the parents. I don't think that I would consider that a serious candidate. Uh, viability, I would. Experience, uh, maybe. I'm not sure. But there seem to be other kinds of criteria uh, that Noonan hasn't considered at all that might be, in fact, much more morally relevant. And it's with this in mind that we turn to a different article I'd asked you to read by Mary Ann Warren. And what Warren does is she provides a completely different set of criteria for persons. And we're going to turn to uh, her criteria at this point and, and consider these. And she lays out a list of, in fact, five different criteria. And I'm going to go through and explain all of these a little bit, uh, beginning with the very first. So one criterion she mentions for personhood is consciousness. Now, a lot of times people misunderstand what she means here because when you hear consciousness, you might think self-consciousness or self-awareness, but that's not entirely, that's not right at all. Uh, con by consciousness, she just means the ability to feel, uh, in particular, pleasure or pain. And so we could distinguish something that's conscious from something that's not conscious. For instance, a table isn't conscious. Uh, you hit a table with a hammer, it's not going to say ow or feel ow or or anything like that. But uh, a, a, a human is conscious. If I hit you with a hammer, it's going to hurt. Uh, if I tickle you, you're going to feel that. If I tickle the table, it's not going to feel that. But likewise, uh, a dog is conscious in this sense. A snake, a mouse, they can feel, they can sense things. Uh, a plant, like a blade of, like a piece of grass or a blade of grass, if I take grass and I cut it, grass doesn't feel anything. Uh, it doesn't have any kind of feelings. Uh, now, sometimes students press back on this and they'll say, well, how do you know? Well, uh, the way that we know is based on neural activity. Plants don't have brains. That's how we know. Uh, trees don't have brains. So when you chop a tree, it doesn't feel anything. Uh, so when we're talking about consciousness here, we just mean the ability to feel. Uh, a second criterion she explains is reasoning, and she says that by reasoning, uh, she means the, de the developed capacity to solve new and relatively complex problems. Now, she leaves this somewhat vague because she doesn't want to spell out exactly what uh, a complex problem would be. She doesn't want to make it overly complex, like you don't have to be able to do calculus, but you do need to engage in some level of reasoning. Uh, you know, the example I gave when we were talking about the chimpanzee of the ability to stack boxes to uh, pick the banana off the ceiling, uh, that would be a good example, I think, of something that's uh, relatively complex. Uh, like I said, you don't have to be able to do calculus or split the atom. Uh, if that were the case, then many, many of us wouldn't be persons. But you have to be engaged in some kind of uh, form of reasoning. Uh, here's, a, here's an example I think of a, a relatively developed capacity to solve new and, and complex problems. Uh, crows actually are very sharp, and uh, crows uh, they can. Uh, there are these certain nuts. Uh, it was this uh, documentary on anim animal intelligence I watched, and there were these crows, and there were these nuts that they wanted to eat, but they couldn't crack the shells. So they would drop the nuts in front of cars. Cars would run over them, crack the nuts, and then the crows would fly in and pick up the nuts and eat them. Well, that's solving a relatively complex problem. Like I said, it's not, uh, you know, programming a software program or, or I don't know, uh, playing Pokemon Go or whatever. But it, but it is, in fact, uh, solving somewhat sophisticated problem. Self-motivated activity number three. Well, what this means is basically just that we have the ability to act freely. We have free will, and some animals are they don't have free will uh, for instance I don't think that dogs have free will uh, now I could be wrong about this but I think that dogs behavior can be explained solely in terms of their conditioning and their genetics uh, those two factors alone can explain their behavior uh, 
Now, a lot of our behavior is also explained in terms of our genetics and our upbringing or our conditioning, but I think that we tend to believe that we also have, in addition to our, our upbringing, our, our na uh, nurture, and our genetics, our nature, we have an ability to kind of step outside of that and make conscious choices. We have an ability to weigh pros and cons. We have an ability to turn our gaze inwards and reflect on the type of people that we are and ask ourselves if we are the person we want to be, if we're achieving our desires uh, in life, if we're accomplishing our goals in the way that we want. Uh, I, I have an ability to think, you know, things like, well, I get, I'm very, I'm an impatient person. Is that the kind of person I want to be? I look at my dog and, you know, he's fairly sharp, but I don't think he has that ability. Uh, my dog, he'll chase squirrels when he sees them in the yard. But I don't think he thinks to himself, hmm, I chase squirrels, but is, do I want to be the kind of dog who chases squirrels? Is that what I want to, to be like? I don't think he has that ability at all to think in that kind of way. Uh, so what Warren says here is another criterion for uh, uh, personhood is basically that we have some form of free, freedom of the will. Fourthly, the capacity to communicate. Uh, this is basically the ability to use language, and it doesn't have to be in a complex form. Like, you don't have to necessarily have written language. As I said, chimpanzees can learn sign language. In fact, chimps have even, uh, within their own communities, have even uh, less sophisticated forms of communication and language that they'll use. Wolves have uh, an ability to communicate. So I think those even less uh, developed forms of language would uh, would would count and it's going to get tricky at a certain point you know I don't think a dog staring into another dog's eyes and then barking at each other counts as the capacity to communicate in this sense because that's not a language that's just a behavior and a response that's going on here but if you have any kind of symbols uh, whatever they are if they're hand motions or uh, you know sounds that you make and you associate those symbols uh, the hand motions or the sounds with a particular content or meaning, then that would count as a language. So finally, the, the uh, final criterion she mentions is self-awareness. And I've talked about this a little bit before. But as, this is just the ability to form a self-reflexive concept to think, I am doing this. To be aware of your own actions as your actions. And I think that less primitive or less developed organisms lack this, whereas humans do reflect this capability. Uh, as I said uh, before when I talked a little bit about chimpanzees, they develop this ability once they get to adulthood. Humans develop this ability uh, around age two. Uh, like I said, there's no clear measure to know if someone is really aware of themselves as themselves. Uh, the, the test that scientists use for this is what is known as the mirror test, where they'll basically they'll take a little paper dot and they'll place it on uh, an animal or a person's head, or a human's head, I should say, and place it on their head and then put them in front of the mirror. And if the uh, organism they placed in front of the mirror can look in the mirror and recognize that the dot is on their head, then that shows some kind of self-awareness. They're aware that the image they're looking at is themselves they recognize that the dot on their head is not a part of them. Uh, you, you place a dot, uh, a paper dot on a dog's head and it looks in the mirror, it doesn't even, it doesn't even know. It has no idea. Uh, but you do it, like I said, on a two-year-old human, they look in the mirror and they see that dot and they know that it's not a part of them and they'll remove it. Same thing with chimpanzees. Uh, they can do it also. So these are criteria that Warren lays out. And the first question we need to ask here is, do these things seem morally significant? Do they seem morally relevant? And for my own uh, personal view is, I would say, yeah. Uh, in fact, these things strike me as much more significant than several of the criteria that Noonan laid out. I mean, especially consciousness, the ability to feel pain. That seems extremely important here. Uh, that makes a tremendous moral difference. If something can't feel pain, then we don't really have any obligations to it at all. If something can feel pain, then that's morally significant. Likewise, as we go down the list here, if something is self-aware, if it can form reflexive self-concepts, that to me is, of the things on the list, 
probably the most morally significant. Because if something is aware of itself as itself, well, then I'm assuming that all the other conditions are going to be met in some way or another. Uh, those are all going to be met if something is self-aware. Uh, and, and that, to me, is going to signal that this organism uh, does deserve some level of respect. Now, it's going to depend on the level of self-awareness they display, because there are higher and lower forms of this, I, I would imagine. Uh, and so that's going to play into this, but at least if something is self-aware, then some kind of uh, level of moral duty is going to be applied to this uh, organism. So what Warren says about this is she says, look, Suppose that some organism has none of these uh, at all. It meets none of these. It's not self-aware. It can't communicate in any way. has no free will. It can't reason. And is entirely conscious. Uh, it lacks all kinds of consciousness. It can't feel anything. Well, she says, if that's the case, then this organism, this object, is not a person. If it has none of these, then it's not a person. However, if it has all of them, then it is a person. None means no, it's not a person. All of them, it means it is a person. And so it would have a right to life. And that seems, you know, you know, at least at a first pass, I hear this and I think, that's not so bad. That makes some sense. And what she wants to say, though, is because it's never the case. Well, let me rephrase what I was about to say. Uh, in many cases, it's not going to be the case that it's either an all or no uh, answer. And so what she's going to say here is... Uh, also, if, it, if something possesses none of these, or if it possesses only a very few of them, uh, and depending on the few that it possesses would matter, I think, uh, then it would also not be a person. So, for instance, if something were only conscious, uh, and if something maybe were only conscious and could reason, then it wouldn't be a person. Uh, things start to get a little more complicated, because what if something was, a, was conscious, reason, and had self-motivated activity? Or what if it was, you know, conscious and can reason, self-motivated activity, and can communicate? Would it be a person? Well, she doesn't have a, a clear answer to that. But what she's going to say is, if it possesses none or very few of them, then it wouldn't be a person. Like I said earlier, if something is self-aware, then I think, uh, if something is self-aware, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't have the capacity to communicate necessarily. Uh, but I think several of the, uh, it would, if something's self-aware, it would have reasoning at some level, and it would certainly have consciousness. Uh, I, I would think also if it's self-aware, it, it would have some level of free, freedom of the will. Uh, I could be wrong about that. So there's a question here about the logical relationship between these various con criteria. Uh, she doesn't go into great detail spelling out what that logical relationship is, Nonetheless, her argument seems to be, from what I can understand, if something possesses all of these as a person, if it possesses none or very few of them, then it's not a person. And, and so, based on this, she's going to make an argument that abortion is morally permissible. And I'm going to spell out her argument right now. And here it goes. An individual which possesses none or very few of these criteria is not a person. Fetuses possess none or very few of the criteria. Hence, fetuses are not persons. If we were to go back to the list, it's clear that fetuses are not self-aware. It's clear also that they lack the ability to communicate, to use language. Uh, it's clear that they lack free will. It's clear that they lack reason. And fetuses only possess, the, they only become conscious around week 24. So prior to week 24, or arguably maybe week 22, their, they, their brain activity is not sufficiently developed where they can feel anything. And beyond that, until they're born, even still they can't, um, they can feel, but the, the only uh, criterion they would possess is consciousness. So uh, when she says fetuses possess none or very few, what she's basically saying here is uh, up until week 24, they possess absolutely none. After week 24, they only possess consciousness. And so she argues for this reason, fetuses are not persons. Then she goes on, if something is not a person, it lacks a right to life. Hence, fetuses lack a right to life. If fetuses lack a right to life, then abortion is permissible. Hence, abortion is permissible. And so this is Warren's basic argument here. And as I said, she d develops what is a fairly... Um, well, she develops a pro-choice argument. Uh, she, she argues that abortion is permissible. Why? Because she doesn't view the fetus as, a, as being a person. 
So now we've looked at both Noonan's and Warren's argument, and we saw some problems with Noonan's argument. Uh, but like with Noonan's, it had some problems, so too does Warren's argument have some problems. And we're going to look at some of the potential problems with her argument. Um, now, we'll just before we get to this, let's ask some questions. And I've kind of already answered some of these questions, uh, and you can think about them yourself. But do Warren's criteria, his one question, seem more morally relevant to personhood than Noonan's? I mean, for my money, yeah, they do. Uh, they, like I said, consciousness, self-awareness, free will even. Uh, you know, I'm kind of in agreement with Kant. If something possesses free will, that seems very important. Uh, that seems, something can use language. That seems very important. You know, social visibility, experience, sentiment of the parents, none of those things ever really struck me as being uh, very serious contenders for criteria for personhood. So we can say that Warren's argument, at least I would say this, you might disagree, that Warren's argument does have a slight edge over Noonan's insofar as the conditions she lists seem to be a little more morally relevant. Uh, but we might want to ask and press her a little bit on some problems with it. And, and a good way we might bring up what these problems are is ask, what do these criteria entail? Uh, what does Warren's argument entail? Um, if something has to possess all of these I'm sorry, if something possesses none of these, or very few means it's not a person, who else, according to Warren, wouldn't be a person? Uh, and the answer to that is, actually, she's going to rule out a lot of uh, things that we would typically, or individuals we would typically regard as people. She's going to say they're not. Um, if something, for instance, a newborn for Warren, wouldn't be a person, why is that? Well, because... Intrinsically, there's no difference between a newborn and a fetus. A newborn is conscious, but that's it. Uh, in fact, as I said, uh, someone doesn't develop self-awareness until age two. Uh, and so for Warren, uh, a human is not going to become a person. Well, it's not really clear. It is going to be a lot later, six months, a year uh, it's going to be a long time before uh, someone who has been born actually has a right to life. And this seems really preposterous, I think, to say that a newborn isn't a person, to say that a newborn lacks a right to life, to say that a six-month-old lacks a right to life. Uh, this seems really preposterous. Uh, likewise, someone who's uh, severely mentally challenged for Warren may fail to be a person. Or an elderly individual with dementia and Alzheimer's would also, for Warren, fail to be a person. And, and so she's going to argue that none of these have a right to life. And so it would be permissible, technically speaking, uh, to terminate their existence. Now, Warren wrote in her paper, her, she wrote an initial paper, and she didn't even consider this as an objection. Then she wrote a postscript to it, and she responded. And what she says is, is just this, and she only mentions the newborn um, problem. She says this, she says, well, technically, yes, you're right. It would be permissible to kill a newborn, but here's why it would be wrong. Uh, she says there's nothing wrong with killing the newborn in itself, but if you kill the newborn, uh, then basically you would be denying any kind of parents who are trying to adopt of the happiness they would enjoy from taking care of it. And so that's the sole reason it would be wrong. So you see, she offers this kind of utilitarian line uh, in order to justify why killing a newborn would be wrong. Uh, but that is, in my estimation, extremely unsatisfying. Uh, I would never say, oh, it's technically okay to kill a newborn, but just because it would make this couple unhappy, therefore it would be wrong. I think most everybody would agree that it's wrong to kill a newborn. It's wrong to kill an infant. Why? Because they're a person and they have a right to life. And so this is, I think, the problem, the main problem that runs in, uh, Warren's argument runs into is she defines these criteria for personhood so narrowly that she's going to rule out the clear cases of persons. Uh, you, this is why you always start with clear cases. Uh, like I said, we started with things like uh, a newborn as a person or a, a, an elderly uh, individual with dementia is a person. We start with those, and 
if the conditions you end up spelling out in the end show that your clear cases are no longer persons, then you've run into a problem, not with your clear cases, but with the criteria that you're trying to provide. And so for this reason, I think Warren's argument, even though there is some initial plausibility to it, in the end, it's just not terribly satisfying. So where do we go from here? Well, I want to make a few observations about this debate so far, because the truth is I don't have a really good answer, and no one does, about whether or not the fetus is a person. But I want to make some observations, and these are, I think, really significant uh, for just any kind of future discussion you might have about abortion. On the one hand, we, we've looked at a conservative view like Noonan's, and all conservative views, for the most part, maybe not every single one of them, but I think there's a trend here, that they tend to point to some biological, distinctively human feature as the criterion for personhood. Uh, maybe they'll point to human brain waves, or maybe they'll point to a human heartbeat. In Noonan's case, he pointed to human genetics. They almost always point to something that's distinctively human and say, hey, if you have this distinctively human feature, then you're a person. And the challenge for all of these views, every single one of them, is saying, why is this morally relevant? And when I say morally relevant, I just be, why is this a morally significant feature at all? Why is having human genetics morally important? Why, why should we care about that? Why does that make a moral difference at all? And this is the, the, the problem they always run into is they never, or seldom, I should say, have a clear answer as to why this should be considered important. On the other hand, liberal views like those of we saw with Warren's, they tend to point to psychological features as criteria for personhood. Notice she pointed to things like consciousness, self-awareness, reasoning. These are not biological, these are psychological features. Liberal views almost invariably point to these. And based on these, they tend to argue that a fetus isn't a person because it doesn't possess these psychological features. However, the challenge for these views is that they almost always define personhood so narrowly that they basically rule out clear cases of persons. They define personhood so narrowly that infants are no longer persons. Disabled, mentally disabled are no longer persons. Um, people suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia are no longer persons. And as I was arguing a second ago, you can't just throw those clear cases out because they don't meet your pet theory. You have to keep the clear cases. And if your pet theory doesn't line up with those, so much the worse for your pet theory. Uh, and so this is really the challenge uh, for both of these views. Conservative views have to establish why the biology is morally important. Liberal views have to, have to come up with psychological features that aren't too narrow. Otherwise, they end up ruling out clear cases of persons. So like I said a second ago, I don't have a good answer. No one really does. Uh, but I'm going to float a theory. And I'm just going to say, look, this is a theory I'm going to throw out there. If you like it, you can keep it. If not, you can send it right back. Uh, you don't have to endorse this at all. I'm just going to throw this out here for your consideration. And here's what I want to say. The issue of personhood and the personhood of the fetus has been for the longest time considered the most important issue when it comes to the debate about abortion. And what I want to say is I think that focusing on the personhood of the fetus is entirely overblown. Uh, I think it's entirely overblown. And I think that you don't have to establish that the fetus is necessarily a person in order to argue that abortion could, in certain, certain cases, be wrong. And what I want to say is just this, is that there seems to be a way that we could carve out a more moderate position in between uh, both Noonan and Warren. For both of them, they seem to, to take it and approach the matter as if uh, personhood is either an all-or-nothing affair, or, or at least I should say that gaining rights is either an all-or-nothing affair. Either the fetus is a person or it's not, and there's no in-between. But I think that's a very simplistic way of looking at things. And what I want to say is just this, is that why can't it be the case that 
that the fetus, as it develops in the mother's womb, gradually acquires certain rights. That it gradually acquires certain rights on the basis of its development. Uh, and think about this. I mean, is it so implausible to say that the more developed something becomes, the more rights that it acquires? And take a parallel here with the acquisition of legal rights. Uh, for instance, you know, when you're 12 years old, you're not, or let's say when you're five years old, you're not allowed to legally own a gun. But you get to a certain age, you can go and you can purchase a gun. You get to a, an age, you can, you can, you know, before you're 16, you're not allowed to drive. When you turn 16, you, you can acquire your driver's license. When you turn 18, you're allowed to vote. When you turn 21, you're allowed to drink, and so on and so forth. And so as a human uh, person develops more and more, legally we recognize that once they hit certain stages of maturity, they're granted more and more rights based on that development. So my question is, why couldn't the same be said for the fetus? Um, there are a lot of changes that take place uh, as the fetus develops over the course of its life cycle. Uh, early in pregnancy, uh, I mean, the truth is, is the conceptus is not, there's not too much going on there. There are a lot of cells, they're constantly dividing. However, nine months in, I mean, a lot of changes have taken place. Uh, the, the organism that's living is now much, much, much more developed than it was before. So why can't we say that as the fetus develops, whether or not it's a person, as it develops, those developments track with certain the acquisition of important rights that it would uh, acquire. At a certain stage, the fetus has no brain waves. Then it has brain waves. At a certain stage, its brain is so complex it can actually feel pain. At a certain stage, it becomes viable. Uh, so we see these, these uh, developments take place. So why can't we say that as the de developments take place, the fetus is gradually acquiring more and more rights? And because it acquires more and more rights, that increases the justification that's required to terminate the pregnancy. Uh, you know, we saw this kind of before when we talked about uh, justifications for ending an animal life. Uh, we said that lower, less developed animals, like maybe a mouse, right? I mean, what's the justification I need to end a mouse's life? I don't know, it was in my house, so I set a trap and killed it. What's the justification it takes for me to end a dog's life? I don't know, it's posing a threat to, to uh, uh, I don't know, someone's health or someone's well-being. It takes more and more justification the more developed an animal is in order to justify killing it. Uh, and I don't mean to equate a fetus with being an animal, but it's here to demonstrate this point about development marks uh, certain the acquisition of certain rights, and those rights place greater demands on us in terms of the level of justification in order to end an individual's existence. And so what we can say based on this is just this. Look, early in pregnancy... Maybe it's a little less morally problematic to have an abortion. Why? Because the fetus is very undeveloped. And so at that stage, what kind of justification would be sufficient uh, to justify, what kind of reason would be sufficient to justify an abortion early on in pregnancy? I don't know. Maybe the mother can't handle it. Maybe she is financially not in a place to take care of it. Maybe uh, she just doesn't want to sacrifice her career. Uh, maybe these would be sufficient justifications early on. But late in the pregnancy, because the fetus has developed so much and, and it has acquired so many rights, these same justifications would no longer be sufficient. You could no longer say at nine months or eight months in, hey, I just don't think I can afford it at this point. Uh, at that point, we've come too far. It's developed too much and it, and it has certain rights. And those same justifications that would have worked early on are no longer sufficient. What justifications would be sufficient at that point, nine months in? Maybe it threatens her life. Maybe she, it, the, the fetus was a product of rape and she thought she could handle it and now she realizes it's creating too much uh, psychological duress, is threatening her well-being and health too much. Uh, and so you see those kinds of justifications are much uh, more serious or, uh, than just I, I don't want it at this point in my life, which would work early on. Maybe it wouldn't be sufficient later. And if this is right, is, and the view I'm advocating here is just that 
Fetal development is very important. Fetal development marks certain changes. Those changes place greater restrictions on what we can do. Justifications that work early on may not work later on due to those changes. If this is right, then this would basically provide an understanding or justification for what I call the standard position, uh, if you remember that from a long time ago. Uh, this is actually the thinking behind very famous court cases like Roe v. Wade. Uh, they basically argued in that court case, some of you may be familiar with Roe v. Wade, that abortion early on is protected, later on greater justification is required. And what views like Noonan's and views like Warren's completely ignore and leave out is the significance, the moral significance of fetal development. And I think that's something that a lot of arguments and discussion in the public discourse leave out, is the significance of fetal development. However, I think that's really, really important, and it needs to be thought about and considered and weighed whenever we're having a serious discussion about abortion. So at this point, we've, we've gone through and we said and covered what I want to cover about uh, the personhood of the fetus and its role in our debate about abortion. In the next video lecture, we're going to turn to and look at uh, the second important moral uh, question I had raised a long time ago, a moral issue when it comes to abortion, and that involves the competing rights and interests of the fetus and the mother. So for the next class, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the article you're going to read by Judith Thompson is easily the weirdest thing you're going to read all semester. It's, it's difficult, it's weird, but it's brilliant. So if you can get past the weirdness and difficulty of it, I think you'll find that it's very, very uh, enlightening.